Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It is Dr. Brandy, and Dr. Brandy is a, um, a MD, and he specializes in, in coaching people with cancer, and he has a lot of great things to say, and I'm very excited to have him on the show today. And Dr. Brandy, can you tell people a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'd be glad to. I'm, I'm glad you... Uh invited me onto the show. Looking forward to it. A um, little bit about my background. Um, I did a uh, plastic surgery practice for about 40 years. Uh, we had one of the top uh, med spas in the United States. We were actually ranked uh, number six in the country by Allergan, the company that makes Botox. I had over 100 employees, so it was a very uh, stressful job. Uh, about three and a half years ago, I had a uh, venture capital group come in and they offered to buy my uh, my practice. Um, but my cancer lifestyle coaching uh, really started in uh, 2018. And in 2017, and I would say September of 2017 is when my whole uh, journey started into this cancer lifestyle coaching, uh, is that uh, I was on a cruise uh with my wife, it was a two week cruise, uh, Viking cruise that when it was going across the Atlantic. And um, I've read well over 300 books on health and nutrition uh, in my career. I, I always had an anti aging division uh, in my uh, plastic surgery practice. Yeah. So when I go on vacation, I always look for a book. So I went onto my Kindle and there was a book that popped up. It was called How Not to Die by Michael Greger. I don't know if you've ever read it or heard of it, but if you get the hardback, it's literally about two inches thick and about an inch of it are scientific references. There's probably over 13,000 scientific references in the book. So I started reading this book and what the science was showing over and over again was that uh, cultures and research cohort groups that ate more plant-based had a much lower incidence of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, really all cause mortality. Yeah. So I'm two days into this cruise and I tell my wife, Trina, I'm going to start eating whole food plant-based. And she thought I was totally out of my mind. <laughs> I'm on, you know, we're on this cruise. There's all these desserts and right, right, meats right. and eggs and you name it. Uh, but I'm one of these people, when I make a decision, I just go at it, you know, 100%. So on the whole cruise, I'm basically eating whole food plant-based. I'm not eating any meat, not, no dairy products, et cetera. So we get home and my wife is still eating the normal standard American diet. Mm -hmm. So we get home and the first week that I'm home, this is like the last week of September, I'm doing a surgery and I felt a little pop in my right clavicle. And I really, I didn't really think anything of it. I thought maybe it was a tendonitis or something, but it just kept getting worse and worse. And then by the end of October, uh, it was starting to keep me up at night. And I, I remember uh, telling my wife, I said, you know, Trina, I, I think I have, I think I have bone cancer. And she thought I was crazy. She said, you're the healthiest person I know. You don't have bone cancer. So I just kind of like sloughed it off, but it, but it kept getting worse. And then it was about a week and a half after that. Um, it was November 10th, 2017. I remember as clear as anything. Um, we're watching television. I accidentally knocked over a container of water. I lunged for it and my collarbone just cracked <gasps> right in half. Wow. Um, we went to the Urgy Care Center. It was completely displaced. Um, I had a bunch of tests run, a biopsy, CAT scans, MRIs, you name it. And they came up with this diagnosis of an IgA kappa a multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer of the B cells, which are the cells that make your antibodies. Mm -hmm. And the type that I had was an IgA, which is the most aggressive. So there's basically three different types. There's an IgA, there's an IgG and an IgM. So IgA is the most aggressive. So when I went to my oncologist, he wanted me to do this triple regimen of two oral medications. And then there was a shot that I would have to go into the hospital every week and get this injection into my abdomen. And it was called Valcade, which is a proteasome inhibitor. 
And the more I was reading about this Valcade, uh, just about everybody gets a severe peripheral neuropathy, which is damage to your nerve endings. Yeah. And and being a surgeon, I was concerned about that. I didn't yeah. want any you know, damage to the tips of my fingers. And the other thing is I had already been eating whole food plant-based at this point. So I told him that I was not doing the Valcade. Yeah. And he yeah. was extremely upset with me. He said, man, there's just no way you're going to get into remission with this IgA, you know, myeloma. But I, I stuck to my guns. And at that point, I went on a deep dive into the scientific literature. I wanted to find every single thing that I could do to enhance my chances of getting into a complete remission. So I was, I was essentially studying almost three to four hours every day. And Every month, my numbers just kept getting better and better. And then when I got to six months, I was in a complete remission. I mean, my wow. doctor was was totally blown away. I mean, he didn't even think I was going to get into a remission, not, you know, let alone get there in about six months. So anyway, you know, I continued to study and, and my numbers kept holding it in this remission level. And then I decided it was it was exactly a year after I started my treatment that I was going to give a lecture on this and share all this information that I was learning. So I, I rented a uh, hotel room and uh, you know, I invited my patients and Facebook friends uh, to this. And fortunately uh, a woman on one of the major stations, she wanted to interview me because it was at the beginning of the year. It was like, it was the new year's was coming and yeah. things that you could do to change your diet and so forth. And she knew I was dealing with this cancer situation. She wanted to interview me about that. Yeah. And then we were able to mention about this meeting. So anyway, 125 people came to this thing. I mean, we were expecting maybe 50. Right. Um, we opened up and uh, we're bringing chairs in from the restaurant. I mean, it was just kind of crazy. And the, the people were standing. It, it, it just really ended up being a lot bigger than we ever imagined it would ever be. Wow! So I was going to give a one hour uh, lecture. It ended up being a couple of hours because there were, uh, there were definitely a lot of cancer patients out there and they were asking me a lot of questions as the lecture was going on. And then when it was done, I actually had a standing ovation, which I never had a standing ovation in my life. Yeah. And I don't know if they were feeling sorry for me or they thought the lecture was good. Personally, I think it was because a lot of them felt that they were at the mercy of the chemo, the radiation, the surgery, and there wasn't anything that they could do personally yeah. to enhance their chances of battling their cancer. In fact, there was one woman that came up to me afterward. Uh, she had multiple myeloma like I have, and, and uh, she, she was definitely overweight. I would say she was even obese. Yeah. Um, she asked her oncologist, um, is, should I change my diet or my eating habits or anything? And he said, oh no, just, just keep eating the way you're eating. And, and she looked at me and she said, there's just no way that that could be right, that I should just keep doing what I'm doing. Right. And, and, and that's typically what I find, um, from the patients that I coach, uh, their, their doctors really know very little to nothing. Uh, about nutrition. In fact, I will tell you in medical school, only 25% of medical schools even have a nutrition program. Yeah. And the medical school that I went to, I remembered it was maybe a couple weeks and it was like a health class in junior high school. Right. It was like, if you don't eat enough vitamin C, you get scurvy. I mean, you know, who in the heck gets scurvy nowadays? Yeah. Um, so it was, it was very basic. So I, I just had an amazing response. So at that point, I started a website, Natural Insights uh, into cancer.com. Uh, I started having monthly meetings at one of my med spas. We would bring in speakers. Uh, and it was really, it, it was really an amazing thing that we had going. And then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And then we had to stop all that, which was really unfortunate. But while those meetings were going on, people kept asking me if I was going to write a book. So I had written a book probably like 20 years ago, and it took me two years to do it. And the idea of that, just I, I just could not get the energy to do that. Uh, yeah. However, a friend of mine introduced me to a writing coach. And she said that if you wake up every morning and write for an hour, you can get a small book done in a month 
-hmm. a medium book done in two months and a large book done in three months. Right. So I started on, um, it was on Memorial day, uh, 2019. I woke up every morning mm -hmm. and then in between, obviously I'm doing scientific research and so forth for the book. Yeah. But I had it done on labor day. And then the first week of November, I had it on Amazon and the second week of November, I had a book launch. So, um, and it's about a 370 pages. It has 500 different scientific references. Um, but it's it's called Beat Back Cancer uh, Naturally, if any of your listeners are interested in learning more about ways that you can, you know, if you're healthy, prevent it. But if you have cancer, ways that you can help battle it, or if you're in remission, yeah. stay in remission. So, right. um, but since that point, I've grown a, a fairly large practice of uh, patients that I, uh, cancer patients that I, that I coach. Uh, initially, we do a one or two hour uh, virtual consultation. And then the part that I think is really important is I have a 24-7 access program to me where they can uh, text me, email me, call me whenever they want. And um, that's really, I, I think, the most important part of the whole program because yeah. We were chatting, you know, before we started this. Uh, every morning when I wake up, I have about twenty text messages from patients that have lab work they want me to look at. Maybe there's a supplement that they're, you know, interested in. They want me to review it, or sometimes they just need encouragement. So, so that's a big part of it. And I think you know, patients do really, really do uh, appreciate that. Oh, for sure. You know, I think once you hear the word cancer, if you're, when you're diagnosed with cancer, that's like the scariest thing, even when they test and they, they see some signs and they just want to make sure and they run tests. I think, I think it, it's just like the big C word, I call it. And, it, and it, and the fear of, you know, having to go through it. And oh and, yeah, and it's, when you... it, it, it's horrifying. I, I still remember uh, laying in there uh, when I was getting my MRI and actually I crying in there, uh, you know, because you just don't know the future. And one of the things that I always recommend to my cancer patients when they first get diagnosed and, and sometimes when they're struggling, even during, you know, a stage three or stage four is try to get a hold of a, a good psychologist that specializes in cancer patients. Yeah. When I first got diagnosed, um, a good friend of mine uh, told me that, and I made an appointment with someone locally and I had three visits with her and that's all I really needed. But she really helped me, you know, with the whole process of, you know, dealing with death and, you know, what are the different things that happen, you know, as you get toward death. Well, what was really interesting is she told me that when cancer patients are about three months from dying, uh, she said 95% of them are at complete peace with it. Uh, they're not depressed. They're not, you know, unhappy. They just have made amends with the fact that they're going to die. You know, like spiritually, they get themselves together, make sure all their family affairs are in order and so forth. But, and then I think pain is something that people worry about. And like, she kind of explained to me how, like when you get near end of life, um, there are pain medications that really can keep all of that, you know, under control. So that's something that I always encourage patients to do. And the other thing that I always encourage them to do is really take one day at a time, you know, wake up, don't be thinking too far ahead, just try to be as healthy as you can, you know, exercise every day, make sure you're getting enough sleep, you know, do good stress management, you know, detox, you know, take the supplements that I recommend and the dietary recommendations and just do that every day. And the other thing I always tell them is try to do something fun every single day. Just plan something fun, yeah. you know, taking a bike ride or maybe just watching a movie with your spouse or whatever. Yeah. So I, I think that's a big part of it, the mental aspect of dealing with cancer. That's, that's, that's amazing advice. And when you talked about um, having a certain type of lifestyle, what kind of lifestyle changes does a person with cancer have to make? Well, in my book, I basically have five precepts that I talk about, and I'll go through those. I'm, right now, I'm doing a second edition, and there's two more precepts mm -hmm. that I'm going to be adding and uh, one is detoxing. And that was one thing I just really didn't get into 
the way that I should have in the first edition. And the other thing is uh, gut microbiome enhancement, your gut bacteria, yeah. which is really, honestly, the more I'm learning about it, I think that's probably one of the most important aspects of keeping yourself healthy and keeping your immune system healthy so that it can fight cancer. Oh, but yeah. the, 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 the five precepts in the book are number one, a whole food plant-based diet is, is the first thing. And the reason I, I really stress that for cancer patients uh, is that there was a really good article written by uh, Nikhil Munchke. He's a famous genomic researcher. And he quoted in this article, by the time you are diagnosed with cancer, you already have about 5,000 DNA mutations mm. in that cancer cell. Right. And by the time you relapse, you're up to about 12,000. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a lot of those DNA mutations are from even the drugs themselves. So these people yes. are getting chemo drugs and they're creating more DNA mutations. So plants have 63 times the antioxidant power compared to animal products. And an antioxidant basically neutralizes what are called free radicals. Free radicals are created in the trillions by your mitochondria. Uh, they have an unpaired electron and they do a lot of damage to the DNA and the cellular membranes. And your body keeps most of that under control through its innate antioxidants. Yeah. But most of our lifestyles, especially if you're eating a standard American diet, you really overload the system. So if you're eating a, a higher plant diet, you are going to neutralize those uh, free radicals much more readily than if you're eating a standard American diet. In fact, there's, there's a lecture that I give and I compare a sweet potato mm -hmm. with a little bit of cinnamon and clove on it compared to a whole day of somebody eating a standard American diet. So the ability to neutralize free radicals is measured in what are called ORAC units. Yeah. So that sweet potato has 263 ORAC units. Person eating a whole food plant-based diet, I use like an egg McMuffin in the morning, a Big Mac for lunch, and then for dinner, a big steak with some parsley on it. The whole day, there's only 44 ORAC units compared to that one sweet potato that has 263. Right. And then I compare five different breakfasts standard American breakfast. The one that had the most had like 33 ORAC units. Then I compare it to one smoothie that has a teaspoon of AMLA, which is the most potent uh, antioxidant fruit. It's called Indian gooseberry. Mm -hmm. That one smoothie has 1,500 ORAC units compared, <laughs> compared to these breakfasts that have anywhere from like 15 to 30 ORAC units. So right. It's really important uh, to try to at least be plant predominant uh, in your diet if you are battling cancer or you're just trying to prevent it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that animal products, um, they have long branched amino acids that send signals to the liver to start creating, it's called IGF-1, insulin growth factor one. And as you're aging, you're getting more and more DNA mutations. You do not want a growth stimulator in the environment of more and more DNA mutations because that's definitely a recipe for cancer. Mm -hmm. So we do know that animal products stimulate the liver to, to form this IGF-1 growth hormone, insulin growth factor one. And if you go through the studies, uh, high IGF-1 levels in adults is definitely correlated with higher incidence of cancer. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a group of Laurent dwarfs in Peru. Now they have a, a genetic mutation where they really can't make IGF-1. Yeah. And there has never been a reported case of a Laurent dwarf ever having cancer. So that's a, that's a really good, it's almost like a Mendelian randomization study. Right. And studies have shown that just two weeks on a plant-based diet, you can lower your IGF-1 levels by about 20%. So wow. when I'm when I'm doing lifestyle coaching for my cancer patients, I do measure, I have a blood test that I recommend. Mm -hmm. And I do try to keep their IGF-1 levels between uh, 120 uh, and 160. So, so the diet is a big part of what I recommend. Then there are a bunch of different supplements. I personally take about 30 different supplements, but... Mm -hmm. When I do my consultations, I send a long letter uh, the following day, and then I make a list of the 30 that I take. 
Yeah. And then for their specific uh, situation, I asterisk, like put four asterisks to the ones that are the most important, three to the ones that are less important than two and then one. And then there's also a blood test through, it's called an RGCC test that is really mm -hmm. quite amazing. It is expensive, but this lab, it's actually in Greece. I, I think you're, you're Greek, right? Yes. Yeah. What's in Northern Greece, that's where they're headquartered. They have a, they have a, a place in uh, uh, middle, I think it's in Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, but they have, they're all over the, oh, all over the world, but they basically take your blood. <clears throat> and if you have cancer, there are always circulating cancer cells in your bloodstream. So they take those cancer cells and then they basically apply different chemotherapeutic drugs to it to find out what chemo drugs are uh, going to kill that cancer. And then they give you different sensitivities. So one may have an 82% sensitivity. Another one might only have a 30%. But the other thing that they do that's really great is they take natural supplements like vitamin C, turmeric, ginger, garlic. Um, and then you can see what kind of natural supplements you can actually recommend. So it's, it's much right. more scientific than just kind of doing a shotgun where you just, okay, take this, take that. And you really don't even know if it's going to work. Exactly. So supplements are kind of the second precept. Uh, the third, which I think is the king of the lifestyle changes is daily exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason exercise is important, I mean, they've found that just doing six minutes of exercise actually actually jacks up your natural killer cell activity. They're the cells that kill cancer by 50%. Wow. So you don't even have to do a lot. Like a lot of times patients will say, I don't have time to exercise. Well, I say, do you have six minutes? <laughs> uh, and there's like a little band routine that I, I made a video for my patients. It takes about, you know, 15 minutes to get through it. I just thought, hey, you know what? Cut that in half. Yeah. You're seven minutes and you, at least you've done something to stimulate your, um, your immune system. In fact, a, a, an amazing study uh, in my book that I, that I highlight is with breast cancer. And, and they, in, in breast cancer, I would say of all the cancers response to exercise like unbelievably in this study, these were women that were in remission from breast cancer. And the ones that just walk briskly for 30 minutes every day, they lowered their chance of a relapse by 24%. Wow. If they, if they ran like kind of a jog two thirds of a mile, they lowered it by 40%. And then the women that like ran for 2.3 miles, actually lowered their chance of relapse by 95%, which wow. is incredible. Yeah. So exercise has an amazing effect on your immune system. Uh, it really jacks up your natural killer cells. It makes you more uh, insulin sensitive, which is really important when you're battling uh, cancer. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is there's two other precepts. One is stress reduction. One is adequate sleep. Yeah. And the reason I always say exercise is really the kingpin is because when you're exercising every day, you feel less stressed. I mean, yeah. how many times have you like felt like, you know, the world was going to cave in and then you, you know, you did a half hour exercise and all of a sudden, like things just seem to be a lot better. And the other thing is studies show, and I think we all know this, when you're exercising, you sleep a lot better and, yeah. and sleep is super super important uh, when you're battling cancer. You know, when you get into deep sleep, that's really when there's tumor surveillance. That's when a lot of the DNA repair is going on. There's something called autophagy where your body's actually cleaning up debris, uh, misfolded proteins and so forth. So you really need to get into that deep sleep. And one of the things I do recommend, I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of an OA ring. No. But this is an OA ring. Uh, you can get it on... Um, their website. It's O-U-R-A ring.com. But this thing is amazing. Um, when I go to sleep at night, I when I wake up in the morning, it gives me a sleep score and it shows me how long I was in deep sleep, how long I was really? in REM sleep. Yeah. REM sleep is when you are yeah, yeah. dreaming and so forth. When you're in light sleep, when you're moving. One of the things that fascinated me when I first got this 
is if you're in bed for eight hours, you know, you yeah. like you, you think you slept for eight hours. I mean, most of the time you're only sleeping for like six and a half hours. Right. Uh, because you're up, you're turning, you're going to the bathroom. I mean, it, it's amazing how, um, you know, you're really not sleeping that whole eight hour period. Yeah. But one of the things that I've been able to do with the overring, there were some things that I was doing that was like interrupting my sleep. I wasn't getting adequate deep sleep is like I was exercising a little bit too late, for example. And I noticed when I started exercising, you know, earlier in the in the afternoon that I was getting better deep sleep. Oh, uh, really? And my supplements, I was taking them like right before I went to bed. I kind of moved that up earlier and I noticed that had improvement. And, and the Oura Ring actually gives you recommendations. Like if you're having some recurring themes that aren't good with your... Uh, where your sleep patterns, it'll actually yeah. give you some recommendations. So this is a real, it's a good idea for Christmas presents. People yeah. you know, looking for a Christmas present, it's great or just a birthday or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it's a really good way to kind of monitor your sleep. And that is really important. But the, but the last two precepts that are going to be in the second edition of my book uh, is detoxing because we are exposed to so many toxins. Oh, um, yeah. it, it, it is. I mean, they're just everywhere. And, I would say one of the most important things for your listeners is to make sure you get a reverse osmosis filter underneath uh, on your tap yeah. because you would not believe what is in your tap water. I mean, oh, there's chemotherapy, yeah. there, there's chemotherapy drugs in there, hormones, yeah. heavy metals. Um, you really have to get rid of that. Um, so I, I always recommend a reverse osmosis, make sure it gets rid of the, the fluorine in the water. Yeah. Um, but I would say that's one of the most important things. I think having an air filter running, at least in your bedroom, I think is extremely important. Yeah. And what most people don't realize is the average woman, by the time she leaves the house, she's already applied 168 chemicals to her skin and hair. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that gets absorbed into your, into your bloodstream. Men, I think I, I read an article, it's like 85, you know, they've applied to their skin. But um, but that's another thing. I've actually developed a toxin-free uh, skincare line that's coming out in about a week oh, or excellent. two. excellent. Yeah. But, uh, but that's something that a lot of people don't think about. But, it's, but as far as uh, getting the toxins out of your system, there's basically three different ways that we eliminate toxins. One of the ways is through the sweat. So that's another reason you should exercise. So when you exercise, you should try to exercise to the point that you're sweating. That's one way we get rid of our toxins. Yeah. But another thing that I strongly recommend to people now is sauna. Uh, my wife and I have a portable infrared sauna and your head kind of sticks out. You put your hands out, but we, mm -hmm. every night we watch like a couple shows and she gets in for 30 minutes and then we like pause it. And then I get in for 30 minutes and, you know, we take a shower like once we're done, because it's important to get all those you know, toxins off of your, yeah. your skin. But but studies are showing, uh, I just read a, uh, a Dr. Hyman just did a post today where uh, he reviewed the uh, scientific literature. And if you get into a sauna every night, it actually reduces your chance of premature mortality by like 40%, which is oh, really, really, I mean, that's really mind blowing to be it quite is. frank with you. But, but that's a great way to get rid of toxins. The other way is if you're drinking that, you know, purified, you know, water from your tap um, yeah. through the kidneys. That's one way. So you want to make sure you hydrate well. Right. But the other thing is um, through the intestines and by eating a high fiber diet. And that kind of gets to the last precept yeah. is gut microbiome enhancement. And mm -hmm. most people don't realize we have about 37 trillion bacteria in our colon. Yes. How many cells do you think we have in our body? Oh, we have, we have, I, I can't, I, it's, it's an insane it's, number. I know it's, it's, it's 37 trillion. It's yeah. as many, we have as many gut bacteria as we have cells in our body, which is amazing. And what's really interesting is 99% of our DNA is actually from the gut bacteria. Yeah. Um, and the difference between me and you as far as our genes is only about 1%. So all humans are about 99% the same. 
However, our gut microbiome genes can vary by like 90%, depending on what we're eating. So yeah. what we found is that the, 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 you have beneficial bacteria in your colon, and then you have pathogenic bacteria. Mm -hmm. The more fiber you eat, the beneficial bacteria start accumulating and the pathogenic bacteria start getting snuffed out. Yeah. The more, the more processed food you eat, the more meat, dairy you eat, the pathogenic bacteria accumulate and the be beneficial bacteria start getting snuffed out. Yeah. And, and what they've recently found through the, it's called the American Gut Project. It's a huge uh, research project on the gut microbiome. Dr. Robert Knight, is one of the premier microbiome scientists in the world. He um, he's running this uh, huge experiment. He's already analyzed fifteen thousand different stool samples, and what they found was people that eat thirty different plant foods in a week. Now that doesn't mean servings; that just means plant food. So you could eat a salad with fifteen different vegetables in it, right. and you're up to fifteen right there. You could eat a soup with you know ten or fifteen different yeah. vegetables in there. But they found that people that were eating over 30 different plant foods per week had the healthiest, most diverse uh, microbiome. Those that ate 10 or less had the least healthy, the least diverse. And they also had a high uh, incidence of uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, probably because from the meat they were eating. Right. So, so that's, that's something that most Americans are severely deficient in. Uh, there was yeah. a recent study, it was a CDC study. Only 3% of the population is hitting 30 grams of fiber per day. And what's interesting, men 30 to 50 years of, old, uh, of age, 0% are hitting 30 grams, which is, yeah. which is crazy. If you're eating whole food plant-based, like my situation, um, I'm eating, I've calculated I'm like 60 to 70 uh, grams per day. Uh, they've evaluated this one uh, tribe in Africa and Tanzania. Uh, they're called the Hazdas. They actually, they're the last hunter gathering uh, tribe in the world. They actually eat 160 grams of fiber per day. Wow. Uh, but, uh, but that's one area where when you increase your fiber, you get rid of a lot of those toxins, you increase your beneficial bacteria. They release these short chain fatty acids. Yep. Uh, butyrate um, is one of the main ones that everybody talks about. There's also acetate, propionate. And these short chain fatty acids have like an incredible anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory effect. Yeah. And the other thing that these gut bacteria do, which is really crazy, you've heard of serotonin. Yes. You know, uh, it, it's the happy hormone. Mm -hmm. And when, when people take an antidepressant, it's a serotonin uptake inhibitor. Yeah. 90% of your serotonin actually comes from your gut bacteria. Yes. And, and 50% of your dopamine comes from your uh, gut bacteria. That's kind of another hormone that is a happy hormone. Yeah. And there's 30 other neurotransmitters that are released by these, uh, these gut bacteria. So they're, they're really, you know, keeping the gut bacteria in a, in a healthy state is, is critical. And I would say for cancer patients, the most important thing is they actually control 70% of your immune function. Yeah. And the way, and the way they do it, they actually send signals across the, the lining of your colon. They actually conduct your immune cells. They tell them where to go, how hard to fight. Mm -hmm. If the inflammation is getting out of control, they tell the T regulatory cells, Hey, you guys need to back off a little bit, but it's just, it, it, it is a fascinating area. And I would say if you go into the scientific literature, yeah, that's where most of the studies are coming right now. I mean, it, it is just a, an area that is growing uh, oh, yeah. in, like leaps and bounds. And I will tell you 15 years ago, I used to go to anti-aging meetings. If you talked about gut bacteria, people rolled their eyes. It was like, you were crazy. Yeah. Um, but the science has just evolved. Uh, oh, like it's just an amazing uh, area of science right now. You know, I, 
for me personally, I, I teach about um, gut health and I teach about um, about detox in the body. And, and for me, I have epilepsy and my epilepsy became controlled once I started incorporating detoxification and I started change, changing my lifestyle and I started balancing my gut and started to do different techniques to, to improve my gut health. And people don't realize that it always goes back to the gut. It always goes back to the core. There's a oh, reason yeah. why everything happens to us and it all goes back to the gut. And if we keep a healthy gut, we can prevent and improve so many things about our overall health. It's, it's, it blows my mind. It just, oh, it, it's, it is, it is, it's fascinating. One of the other areas um, you've probably heard of uh, semaglutide, uh, Wagovi, mm -hmm. uh, Ozempic. It's they're kind of the weight loss yeah, drugs yeah. right now. Well, they're GLP-1 receptor agonists. Well, what's really interesting is these gut bacteria, these short chain fatty acids actually send signals to the colon cells to make GLP-1. So it's, it's like a natural way of, um, you know, decreasing your appetite, slowing yeah. your uh, digestive uh, movement, um, making you more insulin sensitive. Right. Um, but they've done studies and, and these studies are amazing. They've done these rodent studies where they take identical twins, one's obese, one's lean. Yeah. And they do a fecal transplants. So they'll take an obese twin, do a fecal transplant into a lean rodent and the lean rodent becomes fat. <laughs> wow. And then, and then they've taken from the lean twin into a fat rodent in the ro and the fat rodent becomes lean. And, and then they've, they've report, pe repeated that study hundreds of times and it always comes out the same way. Exactly. So it, it just shows you how the gut microbiome, you know, even affects your metabolism, your insulin sensitivity, your appetite, uh, and your whole metabolism. So it's, yeah. it's just, it is, like you said, your gut controls so much of your health. And yeah. uh, and so many Americans just aren't getting enough fiber, yeah. Which is putting them in a situation where they have these pathogenic bacteria like Hungatello, uh, Wadsworthia, uh, 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 Bilophila, mm -hmm. that have been shown to secrete secondary bile acids, endotoxins, yeah. which really make you more prone to carcinogen uh, having cancer, and also what they call leaky gut. Yeah, uh, which really creates a whole nother series of issues. So, uh, so I just strongly recommend your audience to just try to, you know, up their plant content. They don't have to go totally plant based, but if you can just get your fiber at least up to like thirty grams a day, it's going to yeah. make a big difference in your health. Oh, definitely. And you know, our our food industry, we are a rush, rush, go, go society. And and there are so many processed foods out there. And and it makes me mad also because our food industry, we have so many ingredients and artificial ingredients that can are cancer causing ingredients. And people don't really realize what those ingredients are. They don't look at the back of the ingredients. They're eating foods that are are, you know, after so much of a buildup could possibly, you know, endanger your health. And and, you know, possibly, you know, cause cancer down the road, you know, after using a certain product so many times or different products. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say ultra processed foods are probably one of the most detrimental uh, areas that people are, you know, ingesting. Um, in fact, you know, there's all these battles on social media, you know, keto, paleo, vegan, you know. It, yeah. And, and, and one of the things I always do, I always just try to get down to fiber and that kind of like shuts up a lot of these people that are you know, <laughs> carnivores and so forth. But I would say the good thing about all of them is they all tell you not to eat ultra processed foods. And, yeah. and in fact, there was a large study. It was done in Spain uh, in 2019. It was a substitution uh, study and they compared people that ate high amounts of ultra processed food to people that ate more whole foods. Yeah. And over the 16 years, they found that the people that were eating ultra processed foods actually had a 62% greater chance of premature death. So I, I would say, you know, trying to eliminate, you know, the Doritos, the potato chips, you know, the muffins and things like that uh, are, are going to really make a big difference in your health. Right. Like I said, I, I would say that's probably the common thread between all these different diets. I think they all tell you not to eat ultra processed refined foods. So yeah. I, I think if, I think if, you know, people can do that. 
I think that would make a big difference. And if you're doing that, you're most likely going to start eating more fiber because those foods pretty much have zero fiber. So, yeah. um, and you mentioned that there were certain teas also that are very healthy uh, to incorporate in your diet as well. Yeah, there's there's actually a, in my book, I talk about, <clears throat> there's five different teas that I do every morning. In fact, I have a, it's actually, I'm doing a post on it tomorrow, believe it or not. Um, uh, and th there's two products that I have uh, on my uh, website. One is an oncology support formula. And if you read my book, there's 16 different freeze-dried powders that I recommend. Mm -hmm. And um, and a lot of my patients, you know, they couldn't afford buying all of them. You can get them all actually on Amazon. But but freeze-dried powders have an amazing concentration of phytonutrients. And phytonutrients, there's over 100,000 of them in plant foods. And we do know they have very potent anti-cancer activity. But if you take, for instance, a blueberry freeze-dried powder. Yeah. If you if you take one gram of that, it's the equivalent of eating 50 grams of blueberries. Because wow. most people don't realize most fruits and vegetables are like 90, 95% water. So yes. when they do this freeze-dried powder process, they get rid of all the water. It concentrates all the phytonutrients. But there's a really interesting study that came out of China it was on uh, strawberry freeze-dried powder on people that had early esophageal cancer. And they put these people on a quarter cup of freeze-dried powder every day of the strawberry powder for six months. Right. And before they started, they went down with an endoscope and they took photographs of the cancer. Then six months later, they photographed the same area. Well, 50% of these people had complete elimination of this early esophageal cancer. Wow. And 80, 86% at least had some reduction of the cancer, which is really mind blowing. So what I did is I basically created a, a, a formula where I have all 16 in one place. Like on my website, it's called Oncology Support Formula. Yeah. And I actually first did it for myself just to make it convenient because it was taking me 15 minutes to put all these freeze-dried powders in my yeah. morning coffee. Some people put it in their smoothie, but um, but that's something they can get on there. And then the other thing is there's five different teas that I have in my book that I've highly studied. They have very potent anti-cancer activity. Uh, there's green tea, uh, chamomile, uh, red clover, dandelion, and hibiscus. Yeah. And um, and that was the other thing. I was personally I was buying these tea bags and then putting them in there, and then it, it just it was just clumsy. They would come out and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually had a patient like recommend that she said, why don't you just put them all in one place for us? So I, I just recently did that. I have all these five teas and then there's a tea strainer, you know, that you need, like you can buy it, you know, individually with it, Yeah. but it's so much easier. You just, just put a tablespoon in the tea strainer, pour the water in there, let yeah. it sit for five minutes and you know, that's it. So but, but teas have very potent uh, anti-cancer activity. I think most people know about green tea. Is Green tea is one of the teas in there. Um, I mean, there are a plef plethora of studies that show that green tea has a, a very potent uh, anti-cancer activity because of the catechins in there. So, um, but that's that's something that I do on a daily basis. So I do the, yeah. I do the, uh, the 16 different freeze-dried powders as soon as I wake up in my coffee and then I do my tea around 10 o'clock um, in the morning while I'm getting ready. And I actually take my supplements with the tea. Then yeah. um, one of the things I do want to mention, um, and it, it's something I, I did mention in my book. It, it was one of the first studies that came out on time restricted eating. Yeah. And it, and it was with breast cancer patients. And they found that they broke them into two different groups. These were people that had cancer, they were in remission. What they found was that um, those that fasted greater than 13 hours per day actually had a 36% lower re relapse rate oh, compared really? to people that fasted 13 or less. So I personally do a 16-8 uh, eating pattern. So I eat all my food within an eight hour period. So, okay. so normally, like for me, I usually eat my last food around eight and then I don't really eat until uh, noon the next day. And, mm -hmm. and studies are showing that 
that does have a very potent anti-cancer effect and also has a, wow. like a longevity effect because your body, you're giving your body a chance to uh, repair DNA. In other words, yeah. it's not expending energy, digesting food. Instead, it's, it's really exerting all of its energy with repairing DNA, uh, doing tumor surveillance, right. doing autophagy. We mentioned that before we're yeah. cleaning up all the debris and so forth from misfolded proteins and, uh, you know, apoptosis. Yeah. So, um, so that's something that I strongly recommend. And then people that are getting chemo, Dr. Longo, uh, Walter Longo, he's one of the premier experts on fasting. He started with rodent studies and he showed that rodents that had cancer, if you fasted them the day before the chemo and then the day of the chemo, they had a lot less side effects and the chemo worked way better. Really? So, uh, so he took it to human trials and he's finding the same thing. So I always recommend that for people that are getting infusions. I tell them if you can at least, you know, calorically restrict maybe, you know, 500 calories the day before, yeah. and then about 500 calories the day of your chemo, you're going to get less side effects and you're going to get a better effect. And, and when patients do that, they always tell me that it's made a world of difference. Like wow. they don't get as nauseated. They like, and it seems like the chemo is working a lot better. So, uh, so that's something that I think uh, is a good idea to try to eat on a time restricted uh, level. It doesn't have to be 16, eight. It could be, you know, yeah. it, it could be a very, it could be, you know, 14, 10 or something, whatever works into your lifestyle. Right. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, if you had a couple of takeaways to give to people, summing up everything that we discussed today, what are some things that you'd like to pe people to remember some important factors that they should keep in their mind when it comes to either prevention or during cancer or how they could help themselves and maybe get themselves possibly in remission and get themselves in a bit better state of health. What, what kind of take, take it ways that would you like the audience to remember? Well, I would say, I mean, I would say most of your listeners don't have cancer. Um, they probably want to prevent it. So, I mean, I would say generally speaking, if you can just increase the amount of plants that you're eating in your food, you know, in, a, in, a, in your, you know, typical week, I think that would make a huge difference. Um, you know, you don't have to be plant-based, but just remember um, the blue zones, that's where the area where people live the longest, Sardinia, Icaria, that's in Greece, you probably probably know that island. Um, yeah. Uh, Okinawa, Nicoya in Costa Rica, and then Loma Linda in uh, California, that's where the Seven Day Adventists uh, live, a lot of them, and they're most of them are vegan. But, yeah. but those areas are where people live the longest, and they all eat anywhere from 90 to 95 percent plant-based and the seven day Adventist, a lot of them are 100 percent plant-based yeah but in loma linda just kind of give you an example the average woman lives about 10 years longer than her american counterparts and men live about 14 years longer so i would i would advise you know your audience just try to incorporate more plant foods yeah you know in, in your you know maybe do a plant-based breakfast one week maybe you know, learn recipes. When I do my consults, I give people like 10 different cookbooks. There's a bunch of amazing Instagram sites. Right. If you go to my Instagram site, Cancer Veggie Doc, I post two recipe videos every week. And every week I do two educational videos. In fact, when I'm done here, I'm going to be doing an educational video. Um, so the, it's it's really important to learn all these really amazing recipes. Um, yeah. it, it makes your life even more interesting you start getting introduced to more plant foods and so forth, but, you know, just kind of learn um, different recipes and, um, and before you know it, you know, you're, you're eating like a plant strong plant predominant diet. It doesn't yeah. have to be a hundred percent, but I think the more plants you can eat, the healthier you're, you're definitely going to be. And then the other thing we talked about was just try to get on an exercise program. I think that's probably one of the best lifestyle changes that you can make is just get in the habit of at least doing 10 minutes a day. It doesn't even have to right. be like a whole big workout. I think a lot of people get off track. They think they have to go to the gym. And in my book, I actually tell people not to go to the gym because it, it there's too many deterrents. You have to yeah. drive there. 
you have to get changed. You're going to run into somebody. You're going to be chatting. Not you know something that could have taken ten minutes is like a two hour ordeal. So yeah, I think learning how to do something in your home, I think, will get you in a good habit of exercise. So I would say they're the two main takeaways of like people that get is just try to increase your plant content. Just try to exercise every day. That's amazing. I, I, this has been an, really a, a, amazing, a whirlwind of valuable information. Now you have your, where can people find your book? Well, they can get my book on my, my website is natural insights into cancer.com. Uh, insights is I N S I G H T S. Um, they can get the hardback or the paperback on there. I, if they get it on my uh, website, I do give them a signed copy or they can just go to Amazon. On Amazon, it's hardback, paperback, Kindle, and then Audible. So they can get it all different ways. Um, and if and if anybody does buy it on Amazon, if you could give me a, a good review, I would appreciate it. It goes a long way. Um, but uh, that's where uh, they can buy the book. If they want to sign up for a consultation, they also go to the website they basically hit shop, then virtual meeting, and then they can sign up for like a one or two hour consult. And then, you know, I contact them. I typically do those through Zoom. Um, and those uh, those normally, if somebody signs up for a two hour, it's usually a three hour. If they sign up for a one hour, it usually ends up going for a couple hours because there's a lot of information uh, to cover. But, but as far as, um, you know, daily, posts and so forth if they go to my instagram site uh, cancer veggie doc um every day i do a post so they should really kind of and i have about ninety seven thousand followers on there so they could you know check that out oh that's amazing that's awesome and it, do you have do you ever do any classes or anything like that like group co coaching classes where you have like a group of people that come in to, to listen to you yeah i i really don't but i'm I frequently speak to groups like I've had a lot of plant-based groups uh, ask me if I would do like Zoom presentations for right. their groups. So I, I I do quite a few of those and that's usually like on invitation. But I really I really haven't done that. It's actually probably a good idea to maybe do something like that, um, you know, kind of have a like a webinar or something or like a Zoom yeah. presentation and just kind of invite people in. So um thanks for the suggestion that's a good one <laughs> yeah we know it's been so popular lately like people tend to when they do those group webinars a lot of people get onto it and then a lot of people start interacting with people and the light bulb goes off and people give each other good ideas and then you know then the person who is actually leading it you know kind of leads it but then you know people are starting to bond and interact and learn from each other and they're learning from you it's been a it's a, been a really popular thing lately and i and i've been to a few them and, and it seems to be really beneficial and then someone like you who's so knowledgeable when it comes to cancer prevention or cancer remission or dealing with cancer wh while you're going through it you know something like that could be so valuable i think yeah that's a good idea i think i think i'm going to uh pursue that i think that's a great idea now the ones you've gone on do you pay for it or you just go on to it for free some of them are free and some of them you pay for you know it all depends okay Okay. I'll have to definitely look into that. I think that's a good idea. Um, now, if people want to contact you, they could just go on your website and all your information and contact information is, is all there. And they can actually set up a, um, a zoom meeting with you if they wanted to, or ask you a question. Yes. And I also, if they just want to go on my email, it's info at natural insights into cancer.com. But typically if they go onto my website, everything's there. I mean, I have tons of videos. I have all my podcast interviews on there. I, you know, I have, I have blogs. Um, I have different supplements on there. I mean, it's, it's a very, very intricate website. So I have a lot on there, a lot of education on there. And when is the launch for your products expected also? Well, the oncology uh, support formula is already on there. The oncology, uh, it's a five, T oncology support mixture. I'm actually going to be launching that today. So, oh, how exciting! Um, yeah, which um, yes, and then I have my skincare line, my toxin free skincare line should be coming out in a week, and then I I have a little supplement line that's going to be coming out too, probably in a week or two. So, uh, so um, 
it's my shopping cart is definitely growing because a lot of my patients are requesting it. Yes. And, you know, having a plastic surgery background, I mean, I am an expert on skincare. So uh, yeah. my, the skincare line, I think is going to be like amazing. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I, I like that because especially when you had mentioned how many toxins go into people, uh, their skin or in even their hair while they're getting ready during the day is, is pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. It's stunning the numbers, you know, it's like, oh I yeah, I mean, it was it's, that high, you know, I, I really, I know yeah. it's high, but I didn't realize it was that high. Oh yeah. It, it's crazy. But what, what I did is uh, there's a website called uh, ewg.org. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but that's a good place to go to, see what types of foods have you know pesticides and so forth skin yeah. creams shampoos like what toxic ingredients so what i did with my skincare line they they basically you know rate every ingredient from 1 to 10 10 is the most toxic and then yeah. like one is the least so everything in my skincare products are you know there's nothing greater than a 3 so everything wow. is, is 3 or less so uh you know, so that's basically the way that I tried to keep, you know, the ingredients so that they have, you know, a very, very low toxicity. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, before we go, can you just tell everybody one more time your website and I'll put everything, all this information in the description. So everyone has this. Okay. It's natural insights into cancer.com. So it's all like one, one word, natural insights into cancer.com. Um, but you know, if you have any questions, just go on there and I'll be more than glad to answer them for you. You can also, I have a weekly newsletter that comes out. I can, you know, if you want to be on the the mailing list, just let me know and I'll, I'll get you on there. That's amazing. Thank you so much. This has been um, amazing. I, I'm so glad that you came on the show. I hope that, you know, you'll come on more often so we could have you and we could touch base on uh, lots of other topics because I know there's a lot of other things we could talk about also that would be probably very beneficial for people to learn and apply to their own lives. So thank you so much, Dr. Brandy. And I look hey, forward it was, to it. It was a blast. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Always fun to share information. And you know what? This is information that's very valuable. And especially in today's world where cancer is very high and very prevalent in our society, you know, oh, yeah. it's, like it's, this. it's a horrible disease. I'll tell you, it's like, yeah. it's the bane of uh, society. Uh, the, there's a book called the emperor of all maladies and that's what it is. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's a horrible disease. It really is. Yeah, but imagine if we could do things to prevent it or even slow it down and, and you know, the the changes and the improvements in our in our society today, what, you know, could occur just by making certain tweaks in our, in our right, lifestyle. Right. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brandy. This has been an amazing show. Thank you. Hey, it was my pleasure. Hope we can do it again. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye now.